and all eight. John is with us. John Rabino, dollarcollapse.com. Happy Monday, John. Hey, Gary. So, so uh, anyway, from Michael, great show. Thank you. Well, thank you. I have a question for you and John, if you don't mind asking him and also providing your thoughts. I live in a third world country, you know, sometimes called a developing economy. Many of our countries are not developing. We have been hit very hard by one, the strong US dollar, our currencies have seriously weakened, and two, by growing distrust of international investors and bondholders in the stability and growth prospects of our countries. Many of these emerging markets have growing debt and shrinking GDP. That is a curse for sure. This is also adding to the devaluation of our currencies. How do you see this trend unfolding in the short and medium term for quote unquote emerging markets regards Michael from Cape Town, South Africa? So that's an interesting question there, John. Uh, it's working out the opposite of the way that we all thought it was going to work out way back when, isn't it? Yeah. Um Going back 10 years ago or so, we we kind of expected the dollar to get weaker and weaker just on, uh, based on the horrible numbers that the U.S. is generating. You know, we're taking on huge amounts of new debt. We're creating tons of new currency. Um, we're, we're leveraging every aspect of American society to the hilt. Usually that leads to currency problems. But the rest of the world is such a mess that uh, the dollar is still a magnet for global capital um, that, that is fleeing even bigger messes overseas. Uh, and that's making it hold up and even get stronger recently. Uh, and that's a bad, bad thing for countries that have borrowed a lot of dollars. In other words, if, uh, if your country has external dollar denominated debt and the dollar goes up, that makes your loans harder to pay off. You're screwed. And that <laughs> leads You're people screwed. to sell your currency because they, they see that imbalance which makes those loans even harder to pay off. And you can uh, fall into kind of a death spiral where the dollar goes up relative to your currency, which makes people sell off your currency, which makes the dollar go up even more relative to your currency. And, and, and there's no real end in sight. So here in the US, the Federal Reserve is now in, in kind of a, a box or between a rock and a hard place, because if they address the too strong dollar by lowering interest rates here. In other words, try to help out the emerging markets that are blowing up because the dollar's too strong. Um, they risk igniting inflation, which is already above target. You know, we've got wage inflation and uh, asset price inflation here in the US that has pushed the overall official of inflation numbers above 2%, which is, generally considered to be the point at which it becomes a problem and risks spinning out of control. In other words, a, a return to the 1970s currency crises uh, in, in which we let that happen. Um, so the Fed has a choice of basically allowing the emerging markets to continue to collapse and with all the risks that that implies for the big Western banks who've lent all the money to these emerging markets or um, allowing domestic inflation to spin out of control with all the risks that that implies for global financial stability. Uh, and, and there really isn't a middle way as far as I can see, you know, they have to choose one thing or the other because these are two mirror image policy packages. And it's, it's not clear what they're going to do, although right now they're leaning towards raising interest rates some more. So let's say they do that a couple more times. They raise interest rates at the short end of the spectrum in the U.S. Um, two more times in the, the coming six months or so. Other things being equal, that makes the dollar stronger. And that means Argentina and Venezuela and South Africa and Brazil and Indonesia and Thailand and, you know, name the uh, emerging market, they've got problems that are going to grow rather than, than shrink in the next few years. Um, so that might be the epicenter of the next financial crisis, because if a lot of those countries can't pay their bills, they're stiffing big Western banks. And then those big banks maybe can't pay their creditors. And you get this kind of cascade failure scenario in which the world's central banks have to step in and bail out their country's big banks uh, at the cost of a huge amount of new debt, 
put onto um, taxpayers' balance sheets. Um, and that has potential risks that are pretty severe. So, it, you know, it's not clear how we get out of this. In other words, we've got these problems that we've created, um, but fixing one exacerbates the other. And I have no idea how we get out of this without a gigantic crisis. It seems like some kind of huge crisis is inevitable at this point, And we basically just have to choose which crisis we're going to try to live through. Yeah, exactly. Which is worse than the other. And yeah, it's amazing to watch all these, uh, all these currencies blowing up around the world. Certainly not what I expected. You know, when this whole crisis started, the U S dollar was, its days were numbered, John. Remember, we, we thought it was going to collapse any day. And then the crisis spread. And then it turned out, like, even though the Federal Reserve doesn't know how to do anything other than to print money and do that by lowering or increasing interest rates, somehow the U.S. became the best prepared at reacting at this thing and managing the crisis. Now, I have no idea how it happened because I have yet to have seen any competency displayed by any central banker in the U S or any of our economic uh, officials in the U S government and the treasury. I must've missed something, John, but somehow they managed it. We got through it. Yeah. We took on a slug of debt that the world's never seen anything like, but now we're kind of sitting pretty. So I'd like to say we are the, uh, we're the pedigree dog in the, uh, in the kill shelter, you know? Well, we're, we're incredibly deeply indebted. You know, the government doubled its debt, which is already, was already, you know, arguably unmanageable at the beginning of the 2008, 2009 crisis. Well, we doubled that debt and we, we much more than doubled it. If you include, um, unfunded liabilities and we increased it even more, if you include derivatives of the, as a kind of debt, financial derivatives out there. So, um, we are not in good shape. <laughs> no, and no, we're not. That the rest of the world is in worse shape. Isn't in, in any way a compliment to us. And no. yeah, our, our monetary authorities and uh, the Treasury Department have, have been pretty good at managing short term problems. You know, they just bail out everybody who gets into trouble. They've been doing it since the, uh, the 1990s. Works good. Yeah, but, but at a cost of more debt year after year after year. So historically and also in, in terms of common sense, that's the kind of thing you can't keep doing forever. You know, no. if you you lose your job and instead of cutting back on your expenses, you just max out a bunch of credit cards to maintain your lavish lifestyle that you had back when you were making lots of money. Um, that's not the kind of thing you can do for very long. You can do it for a little while and to the neighbors, it looks like you're still doing fine because your, your Lexus is still in the driveway. You still got a big, nice mm -hmm. house, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's all on credit cards, then eventually something happens to make those credit card bills go up. In other words, the, the debt goes from the zero teaser rate to 22% <laughs> and, and then everything blows up. That, those are the conditions that we've created now. So the U.S. looks pretty good in terms of headline numbers like unemployment mm -hmm. and even inflation right now. But if you look under the surface at the amount of debt that we're taking on, it's clear that the repo man is out there and he's coming our way and he'll, he'll take all our stuff away at some point. In other words, via the market crashing and asset prices falling really dramatically. So that's going to happen. It's an inevitable thing based on the numbers. Uh, the question becomes when and what happens in the meantime. And right now it looks like um, the, the periphery is going to continue to suffer until it either blows up and forces some huge change <clears throat> or we have a policy change at the U.S. where we decide that uh, a strong dollar at this level isn't in our interest and we do something to change it. Or we figure out that, um, that the game is over and we do that monetary reset that people have been talking about for a long time. So one of those things is probably going to happen in the not too distant future or something out of left field 
like a geopolitical thing where we actually get into a shooting war somewhere in the world with some other power, like we're kind of sort of threatening to do in, in the Middle East and in the South China Sea. And at that point, all bets are off because that's too terrifying to contemplate. And it would be reflected in our financial markets if something like that happened. So anyhow, lots of stuff can happen. Most of it is bad in the intermediate term and very bad in the long term. And we just have to get through it. You know, we have to, as individuals, um, set our own lives up to be as resilient as possible um, because resilience is going to be necessary over the coming decade. Yeah, very, very true. Something's got to give is effectively what you're saying, right? Something's got to give. Well, y yeah, you know, another good analogy is um, a pressure cooker. <laughs> you know, you, you start increasing the pressure within the uh, the pressure cooker and you've got a, a couple of valves that can let the pressure out. But if you don't allow at least one valve to allow the, the pressure to come out, the thing blows up on you. And what we're doing right now is trying to tamp down everything. We're not allowing any of a kind of a crisis to happen anywhere. We bail out everybody who gets into trouble with more debt, which basically just increases this internal pressure um, w within the system. In other words, the amount of fiat currency that exists in the world, the amount of credit that exists in the world, the amount of unfunded liabilities that, that are out there that have to be funded at some point, all of that increases um, mm -hmm. over time. And eventually something has to give because there just isn't enough wealth in the world to cover all these obligations and there's no way to create more wealth in the moment um, at a level that's necessary so yeah you know it, it, it's going to happen and the longer we wait the longer we let the pressure build up the bigger the eventual explosion will be an explosion there will be like fireworks you have never ever seen right well the, the numbers do say <laughs> that th this is going to be bigger than the 1930s when it does blow up because we're, we're much, much more deeply indebted right now than we were back then relative to the size of the, the global economy. And we, we've got a lot of other problems in the form of geopolitics and and mm -hmm. global poverty and and all that good flows stuff. of people and the environment. You know, there's a lot of other stuff going on that we didn't have back then. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> uh, if, if you just look at the amount we owe and how we have to get over it, you know, what, what we have to do to get beyond the amount that we owe, some kind of a crisis has to happen that, that could easily be more traumatic in its own way than the depression was. Um, and it could be um, a hyperinflation, you know, it could be the other end of the spectrum where instead of getting rid of our debt by defaulting on it, and having everybody be thrown out of work. We have some kind of a hyperinflation where the currencies are the uh, the safety valve, basically the thing where the pressure is let out in the form of falling currency values and soaring prices for stuff. Uh, so the, the challenge for individuals now is that we got to kind of protect ourselves against both scenarios because we don't know which one is going to play out. And that's that's not as easy as picking one scenario and then just setting yourself up so you're ready for it because the implication for asset prices is very different for each scenario. And it, it's not, since it's not clear which one we'll have, it's not completely clear how you set up your finances to protect yourself going forward. Um, so, so you kind of have to diversify. You have to place some different bets out there and hope that some of them work out so that you're not just wiped out, as so many people are in big crises uh, when it finally hits. Yeah, great point. And look, uh, these I just remember my trainer, she was from Hungary. And after the crash, her mother had had a car loan from like UBS Bank in Switzerland. She lived in Hungary, but her auto loan had to be paid back in Swiss francs. And it was killing her. I mean, because the Hungarian currency unit, which currently escapes me, and please forgive me if you're listening, and I don't know the Hungarian uh, currency unit. I guess I'll just look it up on Google so I don't look dumb, John. Um, but point is, uh, I guess they're in the euro. Um, in fact, I think they're in the euro, Hungary. 
because that's why they've been having the whole fight with um with immigration etc but um yeah they don't they don't use the local currency which was the forint forint f-o-r-i-n-t so they use the euro and but this was before they'd been in the euro i guess and or before the loan was made before the euro was accepted so it was the hungarian forint against the euro and um you know, against the Swiss franc, and it was killing her. You know, it was like a mortgage payment for one of us. So, point is that uh, that this can go on and on for a while, but eventually, if debt's growing faster than GDP, you are going to have a lot of problems down the road, right? Well, what happened to your friend um, mm-hmm. is on a you know micro scale what is happening to a lot of these emerging markets they borrowed currency that wasn't their currency and now that currency is going up in value versus their currency uh, and so they can't figure out how to pay it off for instance argentina just went back to the imf and asked for um, a bigger credit line <laughs> <laughs> now, the IMF, when, when you borrow money from the IMF and you're a, a developing country, they come in and they say, okay, well, you need to impose austerity. You've got to cut government spending and you've got to scale back social programs in order to balance your budget if we're going to give you this money. So you, you get social unrest while you're trying to stem the decline in the value of your currency. And that really complicates things. And that's what Argentina is staring at right now. And each emerging market has their own specific, unique set of problems, but they can all be traced back, or most of them can be traced back to the fact that they borrowed um, a lot of money in a currency that's now going up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you know, there, there's no easy solution to stuff like this. The last time it happened, uh, the U.S. ended up bailing out a bunch of banks that were on the hook for this kind of thing. The Asian contagion is what they call right. it back in the, the late 1990s. And if it happens again, it'll be with the numbers much larger, with the Fed balance sheet already much larger. In other words, taxpayers are already on the hook for a whole bunch of things that they weren't on the hook for back then. Um, so it'll be harder to do in terms of justifying the numbers if that happens. And that won't be the last bailout. <laughs> We've got to bail out student loans pretty soon, almost certainly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and housing is starting to roll over in the sense that prices have stopped going up in a lot of places. And, you know, it, it, we don't have a housing bubble like we had back in the day, uh, a decade ago. But we still have a lot of housing debt out there and we still have extremely expensive houses that uh, that could fall in price. You know, in New York City, especially, apparently they're they're cutting rents really dramatically and they're also cutting sale prices on on. Oh, well, condos and apartments. Wait, we predicted a, this record rate. We predicted this after the passage yeah. of the tax bill. At least I predicted it. I knew it was going to happen because look, whether you go or stay in your particular state is often a very tenuous equation and little things like family and business might keep you in a state. But then when you see your taxes go up 50, 60 grand at a clip, you might very well decide that, you know, for fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 less, I could live in a low-tax or no-tax state, and I'll take a plane up once a month to see the family, or I'll move the business, or I'll sell the business to get the hell out of here to stop being an indentured uh, tax servant. And that's what we're seeing happen in New York. Totally predictable and uh, highly unfortunate But you know what? It is the Democrats' fault in Congress for not negotiating with uh, the Republicans because they could have gotten a better deal. Maybe the cutoff would have been all taxes over 25,000 are deductible. I don't know the answer, but I do know that uh, it was avoidable and unnecessary and will only inure to the detriment (laughs) of these blue states, these high tax blue states. And just because it's blue doesn't mean it's high tax. And just because it's red doesn't mean it's low tax because there's plenty of of states that have switched back and forth. So it happens anyways. So, so the bubble, how long can it go on? Well, I don't know, but, uh, but uh, the, what do you think the impact of the trade uh, disputes is John positive or negative? 
Well, that's just one more uncertainty right now. I think I think they settle all this stuff because these are just basically deals that are being negotiated. Mm -hmm. And it's in nobody's interest for it to drag on for years. Right. So I I think it gets settled Mm -hmm. within months. And I I don't think it ends up being uh, such a big deal. Not nothing relative to the real stuff like debt. Mm-hmm. That, that's exploding out there and, and geopolitics where the Middle East is aflame and, and we and Russia and China are all vying for um, supremacy in a lot of places in the world. Those things are a much bigger deal because they're real. This trade thing is kind of manufactured. Um, mm-hmm. Carrie, to, to go back to um, migration from different parts of the country based on home prices and stuff like that. There, there's a really interesting dyna- dynamic out there that re- you know really doesn't quite fit the financial crisis scenario, but I still think it's interesting because, yeah, we've got people leaving high tax states because, first of all, they're incredibly expensive and mostly badly run. And now the, the tax laws have changed to make it less attractive to live in some place like New York City. Um, but at the same time, The Guardian in, in the UK, for instance, just came Came out with uh, an article about how now it's climate migration time in the U.S. This is the era of climate migration because over the past 20 or 30 years, we've moved millions and millions of people into, for instance, Hurricane Alley and also onto the San Andreas Fault in California. Um, and we got away with it because it was a really benign time for those particular natural disasters. But now that's changing, at least in terms of storms. We're, we're, we're seeing big storms bear down on the East Coast. And we're finding out that it costs way more to cover those losses when we have three times as many people with all their buildings and cars and stuff there as before. Mm-hmm. And this is turning out to be an incredibly expensive proposition for somebody. You know, it's either for the federal government via the flood insurance program or for the property casualty insurance companies because they're on the hook for policies that maybe they didn't price quite correctly or for state and local governments that have to do a lot of the rebuilding and everything, too, or for the individuals who live there. And there's now the prospect of people who get hit with something like what hit just hit North Carolina, where the flooding was insane and all the the hog farm um, pits that they build outside the hog farms to hold all the waste. They're, they're flooding into rivers and stuff like that. And, and nuclear power plants are being flooded and nobody knows what's going to happen. You know, all that stuff is mm-hmm. happening. And presumably it's scaring people. So you got New Yorkers wanting to move to the Sun Belt, which is mostly the the eastern coast of the u.s at the same time you got people who are already there who are having buyer's remorse (laughs) so i don't know how this plays out but i I just think it's interesting and it's you know it's a sign of bad planning all around we just didn't think any of this stuff through um when we should have been thinking it through and now we're paying the price for yet another piece of short-sighted planning that's coming back to bite us yeah it's remarkable (laughs) it's really remarkable what do you think about it uh you know, um, yeah, it, it, it's well, it, it just adds to the uh, the sense of chaos out there mm-hmm. now, where we've got a trade war and we've got insane amounts of debt and we've got geopolitics that nobody understands. And we've got asset prices that are priced for, for perfection in a world that is absolutely not perfect. Um, and lots of people aren't making anything like the kind of money that they they really need to make to get by in this world there are other stats in the u.s that uh, there, there are lots of stats that show only you know 10 percent of baby boomers have enough saved for retirement or 30 percent of people can't pay their energy bills you always see these stats coming out and in the aggregate they're pretty terrifying because the the implication is that uh, there's a tiny group of people in the U.S. who have enough money to manage and a huge group of people who really don't, who aren't making enough to get by. Um, and that's also a, um, a, um, a formula for trouble going forward, because that gives you the politics that we're seeing now. You know, if you, a lot of people can't make it and the establishment doesn't seem to understand why and how they're not making it. They tend to vote for outsider candidates. And so that that's how we got Trump and that's how Italy got its new government. And that's how um, Germany's formerly, you know, quote unquote, far right party, the a nationalist party there is now um, vying for power with the uh, the centrist coalition that Angela Merkel built over the past 10 years. And she looks like she might be out 
pretty soon. Yeah. And some new and coalition that, that <laughs> skews way to the right might come in. You know, that that's the kind of stuff that you get mm-hmm. when people can't make ends meet. That's very true. And we're certainly in a situation similar to this now. Costs have continued to go, go up. Your insurance, tuition, medical, you name it. So many of you out there can't even afford to, to buy health insurance. And that's why we've got an alternative for you on our hack list.